and welcome to Tomorrow Orbit 10, episode 41. My name is Benjamin Higginbotham. I'll be your host for this show. I am joined by Jared Head, our chief astronomer. Jared, what are you going to be talking about today? I'm going to be talking about a planet where it is snowing sunscreen on it. <laughs> That's, I'm intrigued, Jared. Yes. Um, um, uh, so, unfortunately, our space mic hologram is out for repairs this week. Engineering has told me they expect to have him back next week. But in the meantime, we are joined by our Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut hologram. Tim Dodd, welcome back. Hey. What are you? What are you talking about Thank today? You. Well, we've got some SpaceX news because there's a lot of things changing and I'm really excited about that. Oh, you're a huge SpaceX fan. That's going to be awesome. <laughs> All right, we've also got the Brooke Owens Fellows joining us and Carrie Ann will be hosting that. So stay tuned. <laughs> Tomorrow begins right now. Good morning. How's everything up in the sky? that in one take. We'll do it live. One. One take. Uh, I, I want to thank all of our Escape Velocity patrons who have helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are people who have contributed $10 or more to this specific episode. Also, we've changed the way we build these slates, so if your name is missing, do please let me know, because it's a brand new system on our side, and if your name is missing, it's not intentional, it's just we screwed something up. Uh, so if you'd like to find out how you can help crowdfund the shows of tomorrow and help us continue to do these week after week, head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. All right. Uh, you know... I got some launches. We're gonna head that over to Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut. Tim Dodd, what's going on on Launchville? Well, there were a couple of launches last week and uh, we'll start off uh, on Monday, October 30th, uh, SpaceX launch of Falcon 9 uh, for KoreaSat 5A. Let's check that out. Four, three, two, one, zero. Vehicle pitching downrange. Now, this was an on-time launch right at the beginning of the launch window, which was 1934 UTC or 334 Central. Wait, but it was 334 uh, East Coast, which was their local time. Uh, this came out of LC-39A and, of course, sunny Florida uh, at Kennedy Space Center. And this, we have to now clarify, this was a brand new core, uh, which means it wasn't reflown like so many others these days. Uh, and this was heading off to a geostationary transfer orbit. Uh, the KoreaSat 5A was a 3,700-kilogram payload, which is, you know, moderate-sized. And then about eight and a half minutes later, we got this footage of it coming down and the freeze, as we often experience. There's and when it came back out. online, we saw this, which... Made me crap my pants, you know, <laughs> a little bit. We saw Toasty. <laughs> a fi a very as yeah, as, as John mm. Fetish you know, Spiel called it. He said, uh, he said it was a little, uh, a little toasty. Uh, I, I would call those things extra spicy. But uh, yeah, it was a beautiful launch. Otherwise, successful payload, successful mission all around. And this makes the 44th uh, flight overall of the Falcon 9. So they're getting up there with their numbers. The 16th for this year, which is insane and the 15th consecutive landing in a row, which is even more insane. So, <laughs> great things from SpaceX. I am obviously just super stoked about all this stuff. So, And, and Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, there's a question from the chat room from uh, YouTube. Yeah. Uh, Slusen asking, are you gonna talk about the large fire on the base of the rocket at landing? Uh, do you have any uh, comments on that at all? Well, I mean, to be honest, I'll bet this happens more often than we're aware of, and it might look scary to us because we're like, oh, it's on fire, but you have to remember what these things are doing. They're re-entering it, you know, at, at two and a half or 2.2 uh, kilometers per second, which is crazy fast. That's thousands of miles an hour for those of us slummy imperial people <laughs> um, and <laughs> imperial people. Uh, and, you know, it, it, we see the grid fins oftentimes like glowing and on fire and, and all this crazy stuff. So it's, I don't know, I mean, it's probably just some paint caught on fire. It's probably not a big deal at all, but we finally got a really good glimpse of it this time. Uh, you know, there might be fires on the backsides of the rocket sometime that we don't see, and we just happen to see it this time, and they get extinguished pretty quickly. There's actual uh, fire hoses on the drone ship. So it's not the end of the world, I don't think, but we just all, you know, for me, I'm still 
I was crapping my pants, like, oh, it's on fire! And then <laughs> some guy at the video control, uh, he cut it randomly and oh. left us all suspended for like 20 minutes. I, if I could have a word with that guy, I would. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta say. And moving on. Uh, <laughs> uh, I believe you also had a launch from Orbital ATK Space Division of North of Grumman. <laughs> the official title of the company, yes, uh, on Tuesday, October 31st, 2017, uh, Orbital ATK, they launched their Minotaur C rocket, uh, carrying 10 commercial Earth imaging satellites for a company called Planet, uh, called Planet, that's the name of it, oh. I haven't heard of them, but let's, let's check that out. Three, two, one, liftoff of Minotaur C carrying the Skysat and Dove satellites for Planet. Attitude is nominal. Attitude remains nominal as the Castor 120 Stage 0 motor propels the 104 <laughs> foot tall Minotaur C vehicle away from Vandenberg Air Force Base. All right, well, this was at yeah 2.37 p.m. Uh, Pacific, Stage not specific, local or 2137 UTC. Uh, and for some reason, they showed us a third graders uh, <laughs> drawing on Microsoft Paint for a second. I don't know what that is. They must have imported that into Microsoft Flight Simulator 1995. For That's a, a space moment. pen, right? But <laughs> I have no idea, to be honest. Why are they um, advertising for Fisher? <laughs> what are they doing? This launched out of Vandenberg Air Force Base into a polar orbit. Uh, it's 32 meters tall. It's about 104 feet tall. It's a, it's a, it's a, Jesus. Oh my God. I, I don't know why that got me. You got me. Oh, ben, I am ben, Ben's gone bug. <laughs> oh my. You think the internet is going to hate me? They're like, it wasn't that funny. And I don't know why. It just got me. <laughs> oh man. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, for so back to the rocket. It's uh, it's a four stage rocket that's all made out of all solid motors, which is the way that Orbital ATK pretty much does everything. Um, this was six SkySat satellites and four Dove satellites. They're all cozy together inside one fairing. Uh, now this is the first Minotaur C rocket to launch in six years after the orbiting carbon observatory or OCO mishap took happen or took place back in 2009. And now what this was. Uh, this happened on board with what's known as a, a Taurus XL, which is basically the same rocket, just slightly upgraded. And this happened back in what was that, 90 uh, or 2009, uh, after it went up, the payload fairing didn't separate from the upper stage. And so the OCO uh, satellite ended up getting stuck inside that fairing and it ended up being too heavy with all that fairing weight and it didn't make it into orbit and it actually burned up on reentry. So this is the first time Orbital's launched uh, a Minotaur or uh, Taurus XL, which is basically the same thing, since that in 2009. So, um, And as you mentioned, Ben, we also do need to rem remind people that recently Orbital is, is working on being acquired and, and purchased by Northrop Grumman. So I don't know what the, will the name be. Oh, we've already Orbital determined that, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. It's Orbital ATK, a space division of Northrop Grumman. That will be their name from here on out. That's how that's going to be. Yeah. Yeah, I'm never going to say that right. A <laughs> uh, question from Sorry. Twitch from Loopy Dragon asking, uh, so for the payload, is it Planet or Planet Labs or what? Uh, and uh, actually, I can answer that. Uh, they changed their name from Planet Labs to Planet, uh, which I absolutely disagree with. Yeah. I think it makes it yeah. super confusing, especially for us on the show, to l describe what's going on yeah. by saying planet. Yeah. At least with Planet Labs, you could you, it, it felt whatever. It, it's Planet Labs lab sounds it, cooler. Anyhow. It, it's a personal opinion, yeah. and you know, hey, it, it hurt me because I'm like trying to read this, and I'm like, and they launched Planet. Uh, <laughs> yeah, off the Planet. I I don't yeah, get I don't it. Know. I, I'm sure there's a reason. I, I don't know what it is, and I don't get it. But you know, whatever. So it is, in fact, just planet. It is no longer Planet Labs. <laughs> All right. Thank you for the launches, uh, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. Uh, Jared, let's, you, you got me intrigued in the cold open. Raining yeah. or snowing? Snowing. Sunscreen. sunscreen. Which is something that all three of us, I'm sure, are well familiar with. Uh, Snowy sunscreen? Myself. No, sunscreen, yes. Yeah, Just so sunscreen not, in yeah, general. All right. So SPF 100. All right. So astronomers were starting to use the Hubble Space Telescope to actually look at exoplanets. And these this first series of exoplanets that we're looking at, we're looking at it in near infrared. And that's because these exoplanets we're looking at, they're very close to their stars. They're giving off a tremendous amount of heat, which we can then detect as infrared light. And the system that we're looking at is called Kepler-13. And it's actually a double star system. 
And with a planet called Kepler 13ab orbiting parent star Kepler 13a. A, a. Now, it's about 1300 light years away from us, and it was selected for observation because Kepler 13ab is so close to its star that its day side is a balmy 2800 degrees Celsius. And that's actually one of the highest temperatures of any known exoplanet. It's also quite large. It belongs to a class of exoplanets known as hot Jupiters. These are basically really big big planets that are very close to their star and they're obviously very hot because they're very close to their star. Now, because those temperatures are very high and also this planet is very big, that means it's giving off a tremendous amount of infrared light and Hubble's Wide Field Camera 3 was used to take a look at it. We also generated what are called spectroscopic observations, which is where we literally take the light, the infrared light coming from the object, and we break it apart and we find what we call absorption spectra in there. There are these little black lines in the actual prism of light, if you will, and that tells us exactly what's made. Uh, exactly what that object is made out of. So we found some interesting things. First, as we expected, Kepler 13ab, the planet, it's tidally locked with its star. That means that one side continuously faces its star as it orbits, and this means that the side opposite from the star is actually extremely cold because it's constantly facing out into space opposite of the star itself, that means it's able to radiate a huge amount of heat that's been generated on the opposite side of the planet. Now when they analyzed the spectroscopic data, the team found that titanium dioxide was present in the atmosphere, and those of you who have ever actually read the ingredients list on sunscreen, titanium dioxide is one of the main ingredients. And it starts as a gas on the day side because it's so hot, 2800 degrees Celsius. And then it eventually cools and crystallizes on the night side where because of the immense gravity of Kepler 13 AB, it's literally six times the amount of gravity that Jupiter has. That's a lot. It's actually then pulled down as a kind of snow. So it's sort of like this crystallized sunscreen snow on but the like, night side. But only at the, oh, oh, the um, oh, what's that called, the Terminator? Yeah, the day-night boundary. It's a little bit beyond the day-night boundary, a little more into the night. Huh, well, area. that makes sense, because, right? Because you've got the, the heat's transferring mm -hmm. and it yeah. takes, and, and, and that's a, is it a gas? You say like a hot Jupiter, I think gas giant. It right? is a gas giant. So it, it's, so it is gas, so that gas is cooling off yes, it as is. it gets further into space and then begins to snow. Yes, it literally <laughs> falls out of the atmosphere. Now on some, you know, on, on some other hot Jupiters, we've actually seen titanium dioxide before, but we've seen it evenly distributed uh, because those other hot Jupiters we've looked at with Hubble, uh, they're not as big, so they don't have as much gravity. Sure. Um, but in this case, the gravity is so strong, it's literally, as soon as the titanium dioxide crystallizes, it starts falling through the atmosphere. And it actually ends up cooling down the atmosphere when it does that. And that's how we're able to tell that it's specifically snowing that crystallized titanium dioxide because of the temperature differential. That must look incredible like in orbit. Because yeah. you don't want to be there on that planet because I, A, gravity would be insane. Yeah. But like, there's got to be like this huge surge of things just like getting pulled through the atmosphere you could see. Yeah, so, um, but, but it's really nice because if you go visit this planet and you want to go to the day side, what you do is you just come like uh, just after dusk and you like step outside of the spacecraft and fly through the titanium dioxide snow yeah. and you're like set, you're ready to <laughs> go for the day side. just walk over to the day side. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, you're like, you're totally ready to go, so. <laughs> And this is really cool because we're now beginning to actually characterize weather on exoplanets. And that's very important because if we're going to start looking at smaller exoplanets, we need to look at the weather and characterize it to determine, even if it's in the habitable zone, whether habitability may actually be possible on the surface. So even though we're looking at really big, hot Jupiters right now, mm -hmm. because we don't have the technology at the moment to look at the small, rocky, ha potentially habitable planets, um, this is very important research that helps us confirm models that we have that can then explain what we should expect with weather on other exoplanets out there. So, good stuff. It's pretty so, incredible. Yeah. And it's, that hot side is awesome. Because it's tidally so, locked, that hot side never gets a break, right? No, it because doesn't. It's, 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 just, just, it's just bombarded by that star. Yep, it's constantly facing it, constantly being heated, so. And then, so then that band of snow is like, always snowing right there, yeah. right? Constantly. And another th interesting thing that happens... I almost said 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but that probably doesn't apply there. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, wrong, wrong scale. <laughs> uh, infinite, infinite hours, uh, uh, what is it, 2.6 days uh, in the week. Um, so, um, but what's... Uh, 
it's amazing because that, that side is being heated so much that the atmosphere is literally rushing away <laughs> towards the, uh, the, the uh, cooler side. So there's winds there that are probably in excess of 1,000 miles an hour. Oh, so, man. Or excuse me, 1,600 kilometers an <laughs> there hour. There you go. So, say wrong yeah. unit. There we go. So. <laughs> All right. Oh, that's really awesome. That's really cool. Yeah. All right. We'll hand it back over to Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut Hologram. Uh, Tim, you are a ginormous SpaceX fan. So, uh, yeah. dare I say, yeah. you wear the fanboy hat. Uh, so, you've yeah. got some SpaceX <laughs> you know, news stories. Sometimes. I'm not wearing it now. I'm not a fanboy, apparently. But uh, there's always news in the SpaceX world. And this week was no different. Uh, we finally have some dates solidifying for Falcon Heavy. And if you don't know why that's significant, because it's we're well within six months. I mean, we're like two months, not even, from uh, the, the potential dates that we're starting to see laid out. Uh, we're hearing that mid-December there will be a uh, static fire followed by uh, the launch by the end of the year. And this confirms, you know, Elon's mentioned this at IAC. Uh, Gwyneth Shotwell, president, uh, she mentioned this again a week or two after Elon mentioned it. They keep saying by the end of the year, and people are going, uh, 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 as, you know, as, as they just had, aren't sure if it can actually be pulled off. And it's really looking like it's going to happen this time. So we even have confirmation on the last, last webcast, the last launch this week that we talked about earlier. We have confirmation that all three cores of Falcon Heavy are in there, which we kind of knew about with people obsessively tracking this stuff, me included. <laughs> uh, the picture shown is not <laughs> is not the actual three cores, but it's a great shot of their hangar. One of the few shots we have uh, delivered by SpaceX of the inside of the hangar. Beautiful hangar there, right there on pad 39A. So we do know there's three cores sitting in there that are they're getting ready to be bundled up and, and taken out to pad 39A for the first time which is awesome. I'm obviously super stoked for this. Everyone's super, super, I mean, Falcon Heavy hype is through the roof right now. It's it's off the charts. Uh, <laughs> people are really, really, really ready for this. So um, yeah, so that transitions into our next little bit of news, which is that now that, so 39A, the, the launch pad that Falcon Heavy will launch out, out of, uh, they've been actually working on getting that ready for Falcon Heavy. And originally they were saying they would need almost two months of downtime after uh, between, you know, the last launch at 39A and before they can launch a Falcon Heavy. But secretly-ish, they have been actually re working on that pad in between every single launch. And now they say there's only a small turnaround time of maybe a week to, or two or three weeks or so before they can actually launch a Falcon Heavy, which is, which is great because this means that we're ready to launch um, from Slick 40. Now, this is a picture of Slick 40, their old launch pad. Um, and this was... So they're going to be returning to flight here in December out of Slick 40, uh, which is about two two miles away or three kilometers away-ish um, from 39A. They're relatively close. Um, and this is the launch pad that had an anomaly last year, uh, September 1st last year. Well, the uh, launch pad didn't six. have an anomaly. There was an anomaly on the pad. but <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That is very true. But it, regardless, the, the Falcon 9 that was on the pad for Amos 6 static fire blew up and it left it leveled. And they've been re working on repairing it ever since. And now that it's returning online, it's great news. So we have a date for that. It's looking at like December 4th uh, of this year uh, will be the return of not only Slick 40, it'll be the return of CRS missions from there, which is NASA's commercial resupply cargo missions. And the coolest thing is NASA is flying this on a reused booster. This is the first time that NASA will be doing this. Um, you know, NASA's kind of been like, yeah, well, we're looking into it. We're looking into this reusability thing, and we're gonna, you know, maybe we'll launch some of our missions on a Falcon 9 with a re uh, reused booster. So for for NASA to be saying this, this is huge, and they will be doing this already. So that December fourth mission will have that. This proves, you know, there's increased confidence in the industry. Uh, so this will be. Let's see. We, SpaceX to date has flown three reused cores. The first one being SES-10 on March 30th of this year. So in less than a year, we've gone from like, oh, maybe we'll be launching stuff, you know, like we'll see about reusability. We've had two more since then. And now NASA, of all people, the kind of the head honcho, you know, they're ready to give it a try and they're confident enough in, in this, this reusability thing to give it a go on their CRS missions. So this is huge. This means that, you know, reuse is playing out very well. Um, it, it's, it really bodes well for the industry, for all of us fans, for all of us that are in, that are that work for the space industry. It just means this is all working out fantastically. So, yeah, uh, and obviously the Falcon Heavy will actually be using two more reused cores. So we're going to see at least six 
uh, cores fly this year if fucking heavy goes off this year. So that is freaking awesome. And I'm really excited if you can't tell. Yeah, there's a beautiful <laughs> reuse booster there. Oh, it's just so cool. Well, yeah. uh, the that, question from the chat the room. SpaceX news. Uh, ch- question from the chat room from Lur asking, uh, will there be a Falcon Heavy payload? Will it be a school bus? Uh, that is the question of the year is what's going to be the payload for Falcon Heavy? Because we don't know yet. And everyone's scrambling to figure it out, me included. Uh, literally just like guessing, guessing, guessing. I still, I've been saying this for a year or two. I think it should be a bunch of Teslas that are like made to just be <laughs> dummy payloads that end up going into orbit, that orbit either the, the Earth or the Moon, and we get all these live feeds of Teslas in space. And you can just go to teslainspace.com. <laughs> Make it happen. All right. You want Teslas in space, Jared? I think it's going to be a 50-ton wheel of cheese. 50-ton. <laughs> Should, shouldn't it be like the world's largest bottle of wine to go with the cheese that's already been flown? <laughs> Why would you do that? You didn't fly wine on the first Dragon flight. Well, flew, saying, we flew, flew a wheel of cheese. Well, it's going to be a big wheel of cheese. I'm just saying we flew a wheel. Of, they flew a wheel of cheese. And you need the wine to go with the cheese. And then what they'll do, they'll they'll deorbit the cheese and they'll land it at Hawthorne and everyone will be able to come up and they'll have a party in the tunnel underneath the factory with it. And that's how it's going to work because Reddit right. told me that's what it is. Conspiracy confirmed SpaceX is a bunch of mice living in tunnels that eat cheese. I knew it. Illuminati I confirmed. knew Douglas right. Adams was right. So, uh, Community of Tomorrow, actually, this is a fun game. What do you think the payload for Falcon Heavy is going to be? Leave it in the comments. That's going to be awesome. We should get, and then you know what we need to do? Here's what we need to do. We need to pull together all of these different uh, payload ideas, get the most common ones, create a poll, yes. and see, and then see how close the community gets I'm sticking to with my 50 the actual ton payload. Cheese, 50 so. ton. Wheel. What did I say? Uh, so Tesla. someone's correcting me saying payload. What did I say? Whatever. Pa- oh, payload is me. <laughs> I, I suggested a school bus, and somebody on Twitter that works at SpaceX said that it was a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, oh, and there was one. Oh, uh, there was one of the last thing I wanted to mention. I know news is running a little bit long, but you referenced it as LC thirty nine A and Slick forty. Slick is space for uh, short for Space Launch Complex. Uh, but there's no S in front of the LC uh, 39A. Do you, uh, you want to talk about why that is? It's a fun little yeah. factoid. Yeah, so when you hear something that just says LC, Launch Complex, that means it's actually on NASA's ground at Kennedy Space Center. And they're just adjacent. There's only a little strip of, of water that separates uh, NASA Kennedy Space Center and, and uh, Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. And so if you hear Slick 40 or SLC, uh, whatever, not 40, but SLC anything, that denotes it's actually down there in the Air Force Base. Nice. Uh, and it's a small technicality, but I mean, because they're right next to each other, it's really just a matter of, of boundaries. But yeah, that's how you can tell if you see LC versus SLC. That's That will let you know. The Air Force nice. changed it in the 80s, I believe it was, that's from cool. Launch Complex to Space Launch Complex, but NASA did not. So that's why all the pads at Vandenberg are slicks. That's why the pads. Slick 2, you, Slick you, 3, you know, Slick 4, all, 6, and 8. All the so. Air Force bases in the United States are. Uh, that have rocket pads are space launch complex as That's opposed to cool. the non-Air Force bases, which can be whatever they want to be, yeah. but are generally then just launch complex. That's awesome. And now you know, and that's half the battle. All right, uh, Jared, <laughs> let's get, uh, let's go to you. JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, right over here in California. Mm-hmm. They're working on a uh, Curiosity drill. Yeah, there's a... Cu- that's a curious issue. Yeah, it's uh, curious, oh, like a cat. Be here they call night. me Whiskers. Um, <laughs> so it's really been uh, a bit of a problem with Curiosity's drill. Back in 2014, they figured they found out there was actually foreign object debris in the brake uh, for the drill mechanism. And then uh, uh, dis- during December of 2016, they attempted uh, to actually drill with the drill, and then another problem occurred that didn't allow it to drill. And specifically, it was a, uh, a problem with the drill feed mechanism. This is part of the drill that uh, is what allows it to extend and pushes it against uh, the rocks and protrusions built into the drill itself that stabilize the drill into the rock. So without the ability to stabilize the drill with those protrusions pushing into the rock, um, you're basically increasing the likelihood that you're going to break the bit of your drill. And as we know, uh, you currently do not have spare parts available to you on Mars um, at what? the moment. So sometime in the future, we'll be able to just walk <laughs> just out. Just walk and over it. and just be like, Rah. yeah. yeah. 
Um, but in mid-October this year, engineers actually ran a test using Curiosity's drill to see if a new technique uh, developed by the engineers at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory uh, would actually allow the drill to operate safely without those protrusions and stabilize it so that we can dr start drilling into rocks again. And this new technique basically involves using Curiosity's arm as the stabilizing mechanism. Uh, and that allows it to supply force inputs uh, from torque sensors that are built into the arm. So basically the arm moves in real time accordingly to how the drill needs to be stabilized. And that's just kind of ridiculous. Now you, guys, you guys watching at home couldn't see that, but Jared, yeah. Jared just did this like arm. He's like, the arm moves in real time. Arm moves in real time yeah, in order yep. to, mm -hmm. to keep it uh, stable, Thanks. Sta stabilized. Thanks, Jared. That's great. Mm -hmm. And uh, the engineers, <laughs> they're currently evaluating the data from Curiosity uh, to see what's going on with it uh, to make sure that that, that test they did uh, worked just like they do with the, uh, the mock-up they have of Curiosity uh, here on Earth in the Mars yard at JPL. So, so. there's a comment from our YouTube room, uh, you, or chat room, you had mentioned that there are no spare parts on Mars, but mm -hmm. uh, Jim Burr does say Curiosity does actually have a spare drill bit. It does have a spare drill bit, but that drill bit still has to operate with the drill feed mechanism that is not working correctly. So uh, yeah, so there's not enough, I guess, let me rephrase phrase that, there's not enough spare parts on Mars. So. <laughs> not enough spare. They yeah. need a 3D printer. Yes, 3D printer. that would be nice. All sure. right, <laughs> we're going to take a quick uh, commercial break and uh, go to a calendar of uh, upcoming launches. When we come back, we'll head out to the Observation Lounge where Carrie Ann will be talking to the Brooke Owens fellows. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Look into her face, determination in her eyes. She won't give up a quick or for a little fashion lines. Filled on some expectation. This girl's a fascination Welcome back. I'm Carrie Ann. Oh, 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 I feel like I need to do because Ben was so high energy in that first segment. I was just reprimanding him about that. In any case, though, we will move right along and make sure we give a huge thank you to our Patreon supporters. These are of the Escape Velocity variety. I'm sure Ben covered a lot of those things. Of course, uh, we also have the, oh my goodness, the Orbital variety. This is something I never do. These people have given us $5 or more for this particular segment of this particular show. They get their name in the second segment as well as the third. They get access to our exclusive Patreon only hangouts and so much more. If you are also interested in getting your name in the show or any of the other fabulous things that come along with that, head on over to patreon.com slash TMRO. And apparently I am on this camera now, so that is a great thing. Uh, so, like I said, I am Carrie Ann, and uh, Ben is hanging out behind the camera, making me very nervous, as if I wasn't already very intimidated by the people that I have sitting in front of me here. <laughs> Um, so, really quickly, I'll see how quickly I can get through this, but this was a lot of information. Uh, I have a Will Pomerantz. We will get to him in just a moment because you have maybe heard his name before, and so you know lots of things about him. And if you haven't, we'll get back to that. I also have a Becca with me. Becca? Perfect. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> uh, senior at University of Southern California. She studies chemical engineering and this past summer worked at Planetary Resources in the Seattle area. Awesome. I have a Diana. Diana? Diana. The first way. Diana. <laughs> Diana. Perfect. Yes. I have a Diana with me who is a propulsion development engineer at Virgin Orbit. Also a recent alumna of S a University of California, San Diego. Amazing. Also worked in chemical engineering, which if I remember correctly, Will pointed out, it was very unusual for our fellows. And we have both of them here. Mm -hmm. Lots of... Uh, cornering the market. Huh? There yeah. you go. <laughs> there, there's a reaction joke in there somewhere. Yeah. Uh, and we also have a Miss Jocelyn. I uh, was a junior... Jocelyn, actually. Jocelyn. Oh, I'm so sorry. No worries, it's no worries. the extra Y that I managed to accidentally type in there. Uh, junior <laughs> University of Southern California, where mm -hmm. she studies astronomical engineering and this past summer worked at Aerospace Corporation here mm -hmm. in Southern California. Whew. All right, I got everybody, right? Yes. And then Will. Yeah. Mr. Yeah. Will Pomeranz. Yeah. Just Will. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just the engineer, it's where it belongs. Mr. Will, one of the reasons that we have you on here is because you are a co-founder of the Brooke Owens Fellowship, which is very really important, and that's the reason why all these lovely ladies are here. And so uh, for those people who don't know you and don't know our relationship, we go way, way back to the Space Vidcast days yes, and the uh, X Prize Foundation when you were over there. 
You've done way too many things to even remotely name here. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we got to bond, really bond, over the Northrop Grumman Lander Lu yeah. Northrop Grum Grumman Lunar Lander Challenge. Oh my goodness, which is becoming more popular again for those of you who it's haven't bad. looked it up in a while. Yeah. yeah, that's that's a super that's a super awesome thing. Uh, but tell me, if you will, a little bit about the Brooke Owens Fellowship, why we have it, where it came from. What's going on? Sure. So the Brooke Owens Fellowship Program is a, is a brand new program. It's only a little over a year old, and it's really designed to propel incredible undergraduate women on to become just absolute leaders in the aerospace industry. And by aerospace, I mean both aviation and, and space exploration. Awesome. Um, Brooke Owens, our, our namesake, was a dear personal friend of mine, mm -hmm. uh, but also just a, a real leader in the aerospace industry. She worked with me at XPRIZE. You might have gotten to know her personally mm -hmm. back in the Lunar Lander Challenge days. Yeah. Uh, from there, she went to the Federal Aviation Administration. She worked at the White House Office of Management and Budget. She worked at NASA. She worked in all these kind of different amazing jobs. She managed to be popular in some unpopular positions. You know, the people at the White House, OMB, it doesn't matter who's the president. Nobody totally. likes them. <laughs> their, their job <laughs> is to control the first strings. And, uh, but yeah, everybody, everybody loved Brooke. Uh, and outside of the things that she did professionally, she was also just a really incredible person. She was wildly creative. She would do, you know, her hobbies would be things like slam poetry and like, yeah. I think I'm just going to become a DJ. And a month later, like, she's getting paid gigs as, <laughs> as a DJ. She was hugely uh, involved in, in terms of sort of giving back to her community. She was a deeply religious woman. She did a lot of time uh, over in Africa helping out with orphanages and helping uh, people recover from AIDS and, and HIV and, and, and things like that. Uh, she was taken from us way too young, uh, a little over a year ago. She had battled with cancer for a long time and, and finally succumbed to that. And because of who Brooke was as a, as a warm, outgoing leader in this community, um, a lot of us were gathered together at her memorial service saying, you know, not only am I going to miss Brooke as a friend, I'm also going to miss the chance to have her sitting at the desk right next to me mm -hmm. leading this industry because she did it in such a purposeful way as well as such an intelligent way. So at some kind of selfish level, we said, well, how can I get more Brooks into the industry? <laughs> That's so perfect, yeah, though. I love exactly. that idea. And, and we also sort of recognize that, as, as everyone knows, you know, our, our industry doesn't have the best track record historically of being welcoming to all types of people. You know, right. you know obviously, historically, that was illegal for long times. And, right. and now it's legal, but, uh, but still the numbers aren't what they should be. So yeah. we said, hey, I think there's an opportunity here where we can, where we can uh, serve a couple different purposes. We can, we can serve our selfish purposes of making new friends who are as awesome as Brooke was. Uh, and also we can give a helping hand to uh, some really deserving uh, young applicants. So working very closely with Lori Garver uh, from the Airline Pilots uh, uh, Association as well as the um the former deputy administrator of NASA. I was going to say, Ka maybe a name you yeah, might have heard of before, before right? Okay. A couple yeah. times. Uh, and then Cassie Lee up at Vulcan and Strata Launch up in the Seattle area, both of whom were also incredibly close personal friends uh, of Brooke. We put together this, uh, this program where we said, hey, let's go out and find the absolute best candidates that we can find in the entire world. Uh, focused in the U.S., but not limited solely to that. These poor ladies are like, man, yeah, yeah, stop. I'm, I'm You're like, too much up. pressure. They are, uh, they're, they're kind of used to me hyping them up at this point. Good, good. Uh, let's, let's put them through the ringer with an incredibly difficult application process. Mm -hmm. um, let's make them put in lots of hours over holiday breaks and things like that to show that they really want this. Perfect. Uh, and then if they've earned it, let's give them jobs at the absolute coolest businesses and nonprofits in yeah. the aerospace industry. And let's give them one-on-one -on -one personal mentorship relationships with CEOs, with astronauts, with award-winning journalists and, and just about everyone we can. Uh, so that, that with that, the program was born. Um, the three of us really just kind of were making it up as we went along. Uh, launched a web page and opened up applications a few days later, basically. Uh, our, our, our goal was to get 10 fellows. And mm -hmm. we said our real stretch goal was maybe if everything has gone beyond our wildest dreams, we'll get 15. Uh, and we ended up with 36. <laughs> Uh, so, and, and 36 of the most that inspiring right. and capable young women, uh, or people in general, that, I, mm -hmm. that I've ever had the pleasure pleasure to meet. And, and now I'd love to focus the attention in on, on just three of them that happen that to live like, That's what we put you back there anyway. So, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, man. Okay, perfect. How are we going to top that introduction? I know. I, I know. Honestly. Right? That's why I said. It sucks, you guys. I know. Uh, <laughs> Can't bring them anywhere. This is very true. This is very true. But uh, that's okay. Tim can always mute his mic if we need to. <laughs> Uh, okay, so there you go. Perfect. Uh, so, so 2017 was the inaugural year for mm -hmm. the fellowship itself, which means this didn't exist before, which means you guys must have heard about it somehow. Yeah. So uh, I'll start here. Yeah. How did you hear about the fellowship and why did you decide to get involved? 
Um, so I actually heard about it. Um, I had interned at what is now Virgin Orbit mm -hmm. um, the previous summer. So I had known Will briefly um, and connected with him on LinkedIn. Um, and then I actually saw him share the post about the fellowship, um, which is how I first heard about it. Um, and scrolling through, it just seemed like a great opportunity. Um, as was kind of mentioned, as a chemical engineering major, it's mm -hmm. kind of difficult to break into the mm -hmm. aerospace industry when so many of the positions are kind of geared more towards the more typical majors. Sure. Um, and especially as someone that wants to work on the business side, with um, I have an economics minor, so I nice. ultimately want to work in business development. Um, so it's a pretty niche spot, so this fellowship seemed like a great way to kind of get in and get great mentorship and meet amazing people along the way, and that's really what it was. Perfect. So. Jocelyn? Yeah. yeah, so I actually heard it from my school's advisor. Um, mm. she, she was She's very good about um, blasting out emails. There's a whole 12 of us in the department, so there's not too many people to reach out. But yeah, it was back in October. It was this email like, hey, by the way, this, there's a fellowship opportunity. I clicked on the link. And the more I read, the more I just fell in love with the idea. Because like, not only was it an internship, which I was looking for a job, but there was like a creative element to it. Mm. There was the conference. There was like a focus on community, one-on-one mm -hmm. -on -one mentorship. And I just knew that knew that I had had to apply. And luckily the timing worked out because um, I was studying abroad, so my breaks were weird. So I actually had a whole month to work on the application and obsess over <laughs> way too many details that I probably <laughs> didn't need to, but. Perfect. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's how I heard about it. I love it, Diana. Um, I had a mentor in UC San Diego, and he loves giving opportunities for, for his students in college. So he was searching in Google, going to like the fifth and sixth page, and he <laughs> looked into this fellowship and forwarded it to me. And I looked at it, I was in love, but I couldn't comprehend the idea of how come this is possible. <laughs> there were just, and I was looking at the pictures of the mentors and like yeah. the mm. TV hosts and CEOs and astronauts. I was like, this, this might be a joke. Like, I, I can't believe <laughs> it's this. It's too good to be true. Yeah, and I put it in my favorite mm. tab and I like forgot about it because I was in finals and all. Oh, sure. And then I started applying and getting deeper into the application. It was a very unique way of interviewing us before mm -hmm. even seeing us. Mm -hmm. They had us rate what are the important traits that we want in our internship. Do we care about hands-on or do we care about the location of where we work? Do we care about learning about policy or more mm -hmm. engineering? Nice. This is something that I never experienced. I worked at multiple internships before mm -hmm. and I never got the opportunity to pick what exactly I want to work on. And nice. I picked I want to be working in a technical environment and I got that when I worked at Virgin Orbit. This is exactly what I got, and it was the perfect opportunity. That's awesome. That's so awesome. Okay, so you guys talked a little bit about uh, the application process. Mm -hmm. uh, it, for those of you who want to play along at home, uh, brookowensfellowship.com will give you all of the information you could possibly ever .org. want. .org. Dot .org. I apologize. <laughs> I said .com, didn't I? Yeah. I get used to that. Uh, sometimes I say tomorrow.com, too. Um, <laughs> it just gets, <laughs> like I said. Uh, so brookowensfellowship.org. You can also Google it. I'm sure it'll pop. Oh yes, it will pop right no, up. It will pop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I I poured over all of the information uh, on the website last night, which awesome. was fantastic. And, and exactly mm -hmm. as you're saying, the list of mentors just goes on yeah. and on and on. It, it feels like you're never going to hit bottom uh, <laughs> yeah. on the page itself. But uh, each one of the mentors is just like, oh yeah, and like either I know that name or I know that company or mm -hmm. I've never heard of that. And, oh, that sounds really interesting. Yeah. Uh, so I w I was super jealous that uh, I. Didn't can't apply, but um, <laughs> I kind of feel the same way. <laughs> <laughs> Which is funny, being married to another mentor. But uh, we'll ignore that for a second. Uh, <laughs> thank you, uh, Kay McCoy. Put it in the chat room for me. BrookeOwensFellowship.org. So there you go. Perfect. Uh, where was I going? Oh yes. So tell me a little bit about the application process. I mean, you kind of touched on that a little bit. Uh, actually, you all sort of touched on that a little bit. How was that for you? Like, you said that it was very different from any other thing that you would apply to because of how specific it was. Uh, what were maybe some of your favorite challenges in that application process itself? Um, one thing that I never saw anywhere else is submitting a creative yeah. piece. Mm. And this is important for me because my dad is an artist, full-time job. He's an engineer, but an artist. Awesome. And I really appreciated that because there's a lot, a lot of artist creative side that you can show in an engineer that could act actually help you in your full-time job and mm -hmm. as your personality too. I really appreciated that the, the women in the fellowship submitted poems and songs and recordings and 
It was amazing. This is this is was my favorite part, but it was also the most challenging. Interesting. Yeah, I could see that. Mm -hmm. it, it was something that when we were designing the application process, you know, Lori and Cassie and I were drawing on our experience at our day jobs. Mm -hmm. And we all have the great fortune to work at places where a lot of people want to work. So you get a stack of applications pretty big. And totally. It's hard to tell candidates apart. You know, they, sure. they all, just from a single sheet of paper, one CV mm -hmm. and one transcript, everyone can look pretty similar. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, we, just like with the fellowship program, we're lucky enough, we attract a lot of students who have, you know, a fantastic GPA at a great school, and that's wonderful. Sure. Um, but that's not everything that there is to life. Yeah, totally. And, and we also recognize that that's only one track. There are, there are a lot of students who maybe their GPA isn't as good because they are also an entrepreneur and they're a CEO of a company on the side, or they're supporting their family, or mm -hmm. they're learning English in parallel to all this kind of things. So we sure. wanted to really make sure that we were calling out some of those stories there, because those mm -hmm. are attributes of leadership and, and talent and intelligence just as much as, as good grades from a good school are. Did anybody bake cookies? <laughs> well, we didn't give people Ooh. a physical address. Yeah, said we had paintings, we had songs, we had slam poetry, we had mm -hmm. uh, radio plays. It was a, really a, a, a wide range of, of things that were submitted. Nice. Yeah. And I feel like part of it is also, um, from what I've heard about makes Brooks so special, mm -hmm. I feel like by looking at the whole picture, you know, not only just like, you know, technical skills are like really good in career but also just very well rounded and very creative I feel like that really captured the spirit of who Brooke was mm -hmm. and I feel like that is kind of the best way to like to honor her is to is to make sure that the application you're getting um, you're getting women who are have a little bit of everything yeah totally Totally. Ms. Becca? Yeah, I think I just appreciated how much, more so than just the standard application, they really tried to get to know us. And yeah. beyond just trying to get to know us personally, they wanted to know what we wanted out of yeah. an internship. And I think when you're applying to the fellowship program and then you're applying to standard internships, they really don't even compare. Oh. Yeah. Like when you have personal conversations with the founders and they're mm -hmm. interviewing you, but also wanting to make sure that they can find the best fit for you. And um, everything was just done with so much care yeah. that it really... Mm -hmm stands out from any other application I've ever done. That's awesome. So uh, we kind of chatted about this a little bit before we were on air. Uh, this, like I said, this was the inocular. Uh, and now the for 2018, the application process is open. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even have to ask, because you already had, uh, were very upset that you were unable to reapply. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I know there was, there was definitely talk among all of us. We were, people were asking, can we, can we apply again? Mm -hmm. But... Um, yeah, the, we got we asked and the answer was no. So I might just apply anyway. <laughs> <laughs> like like I, I'm better. I'm a better version of myself than last year. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> that's actually that's a really fantastic point, and I definitely want to get back to that. But well, what's what is the reasoning behind that? What's the idea? Because we've had like uh, I've seen a number of companies have interns. Interns come free in for a summer, they go back to school, yep. they come back, maybe they have another internship, and maybe even in a different area of the company, uh, but it's you know still the same company, but it's a second internship. What, what was the reasoning behind that? Uh, I would say, as far as I'm concerned, each of these three women and their 30, 33 peers who are elsewhere around the, the country and, and the world, in fact, uh, are pretty much already guaranteed to, to succeed. Now, uh, that was probably true even before we met them, but sure. now with the experiences they've had this summer, like they're on a path. And we don't need to help them anymore because they know how to help themselves. And they're helping each other. The, these gals are in a, uh, I don't know if it's a Snapchat or a Facebook group or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. What are those other? crazy yeah. kids are doing these yeah. days? All exactly. of them. It's a <laughs> yak or something. They're, they're, they're supporting each other. And they still have these relationships with, with their mentors. And, you know, their mentors are executives of companies. They're astronauts, thing, things like that. So we want to really spread that community yeah. around. And also to build this cohort of young women that will be able to get to know each other because we definitely saw in this program I think some lifelong friendships forged. It's 36 strong personalities so I'm sure not everyone is best friends with everyone sure. but a lot of them are best friends <laughs> with someone that they met in this program yeah, now yeah, yeah. And, and being able to double our numbers there um, is something really exciting. We also didn't just want to add more spots mm -hmm. even though we find ourselves now in this wonderful position of we have a waiting list of companies who want to hire our fellows. We have, uh, our, our demand pretty dramatically outstrips our supply and uh, we just didn't feel that if, if we grew the program from 36 up to 50, mm -hmm. and we definitely got the demand for that if we wanted to, we didn't feel we could offer as good an experience with the mentor mm -hmm. matches, with things like uh, we brought all of our fellows together for a summit in the middle of the summer and mm -hmm. didn't let them sleep for about four or five days because we <laughs> jam-packed it, it full, full of it activities. And, and we just couldn't scale that up to a, to, to a bigger number. I no, think. that's totally fair. And that's we also want to benefit 
more women yeah. in the industry. I feel there's a lot of people who really, really, really need this, maybe more than I ever did. Yeah. And it would be really cool that they can get to see what we're talking about because words can't describe. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. And what we can't apply again, we're all very excited to remain involved and to mm -hmm. get to know Definitely. the new fellows and just kind of stay connected yeah, with the community we've built. The summit. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, they actually have, uh, the, the Brooke Owens Fellowship Program has uh, brought us a lot of us back on for, to be volunteers, whether it's uh, mentors for uh, future future Brookies, as mm -hmm. we call as we call ourselves, or um, so running the summit, running the social media. So we're definitely, even though the summer's over and our internships are over, um, a lot of us are still involved with the program and will continue to be for for as long as they'll they'll let me yeah, they'll let us. as long as they invite us. Well, let's also quickly add a, a number of our brookies have returned to their host company for mm -hmm. full time jobs. I mean yes. you heard that from Deanna oh, already. Yeah. And, and that, that was true actually I think almost all of our graduating seniors um, got a job offer to come yeah. back if they wanted to. Uh, and then additionally, um, we have uh, helped create our first spin-off program now. So yeah. um, there's a program now called the Matthew Isaacwitz Fellowship Program. Awesome. It's one of those things where like, I'm really sad it exists because it's another right. awesome person we lost. Matthew Isaacwitz yeah. um, was, a, was a really fantastic guy, had worked at uh, the Commercial Space Flight Federation, um, worked at Planetary Resources, uh, and passed away far too young. And his dad, Steve Isaacwitz, who's my former boss, is the CEO of the Aerospace Corporation, who was, um, who was Jocelyn's host yes. over the summer, along yes. with two other fantastic fellows there, really liked what we'd done with the Brook Owens model. He, his company had benefited from it directly. Awesome. So he created a spin-off program, which is open to both men and women, and is open to both undergraduates and graduate students. And I know he's Perfect. really hoping that, that some of these mm -hmm. folks uh, will apply next yeah. year who are Brookies already, in mm -hmm. addition to, to others who are, who are new to it. Very, very cool. Uh, so I want to get back to yeah. how you feel like this fellowship has affected you, how, how you have grown over the course of this, what is typically considered just a short internship. I, mm -hmm. I know I've seen some companies that have had like three month internships and some people have said, but I, I stretched it out to five. Or like, you know, they have a couple of extra internships, they just kind of keep piling them on until they hope that maybe they get a, a full time job wherever it is that they're at. Uh, so considering what it's 13 weeks? It varies a little bit yeah. from host to host, Ten, but it's yeah. usually, usually Ten, in, that, yeah. in that range. Gotcha. Yeah. So how much do you feel that you really have changed or grown or blossomed, I guess, if you will, yeah. <laughs> in the, that amount of time? Wow. The thing is, when I start an internship usually, you mm -hmm. just meet a couple people and you learn a few things. Other than working with Virgin Orbit was extremely hands-on. Awesome. They, they need you, you need to do some real work. It's not like an You're education. not just getting coffee? No, you're not oh, just getting weird. coffee and like, you know, <laughs> chatting. I learned a lot technically, but in the same time, the fellowship itself taught me that there's other aspects to engineering. I was this, you know, naive student who thinks, yeah, you just, you, you just become an engineer if you love engineering. But right. there's policy and there is business and there's mm -hmm. a lot of different aspects. And when I met all other women in the fellowship, not everyone is just interested in engineering. People sure. wanted to be like congresswomen and they wanted to be in, you know, changing policy for space in the future. This was very inspiring. Um, so in terms of my personal knowledge, that grew a lot, but also I, I started realizing how um, there's so much more that you can learn every day. And with an internship, with a regular internship, it's you're, you're just focused on getting a job. Sure. But when I was working at Virgin Orbit, I kind of felt like this is where I belong. And this is like, even if I didn't get the job, there's so much that I learned that I don't need to worry about impressing my boss or impressing the next person I speak to. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Awesome answer. Jocelyn? Oh, that's hard. It's a hard answer to be. <laughs> um, for me, um, so I applied when I was a sophomore in college. I was one of the young, one, younger, I think the one, either the youngest or one of the youngest fellows. And I'd never had like um, a job in industry before. And I, I mean, I applied because I was really passionate, but I'm like, I'm never going to get this. I'm never going to get in because it's just too, too cool. Like these people must be phenomenal. And when I actually got into the program, it was a shock. It, you know, they, people talk about imposter syndrome all the time, and sure. I had a really, I had a really bad case with it. Especially, I started friending everybody, and you know, <laughs> someone's a CEO and had like five internships already, and like just going through, it felt hard to like. I started comparing myself. I'm like, I, why did I get in? Sure. And as the program went on, I, you know, as I did my internship and excelled in in the work that I was doing. And the more people I met, and, and my confidence just grew so much. And I realized that 
I do, I do deserve this, and, and totally. I can do it. And um, especially the conference was a big um, aspect of that for me because we had um, this group project that we worked on, these grand challenges, mm -hmm. where you know, they put us in groups, I believe six? Mm -hmm. Yeah, six of us. And it, we were given like less than 48 hours to solve uh, drought or solve um, you know, a the asteroid problem. And, like, and you did solve those, right? Yeah, well, oh, yeah, we, tried. We just published those papers. <laughs> yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, not a problem. That'll be next week's episode. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we actually <laughs> solved drought. <laughs> publishing it. We considered I don't yeah. know. No, yeah. I know our group definitely considered like yeah. bringing it further. But like just the fact that in that fast-paced environment, I was not only able to keep up, but like contribute meaningfully and present. I, I just I realized that, yeah, that I could I could do it, and I feel like now. When I'm applying, it's no longer I'll take whatever is offered to me. Now I can be a bit more choosy. I can be like, no, I, this is what I want. Awesome. And I'm capable of doing it. So I feel like that was the biggest growth for me personally. Awesome. Awesome. Miss Becca. I think I have to echo what Diana said. Um, I, you just, I think beyond just the typical internship, you learn so much about the industry. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And I think what I've kind of seen is that the aerospace industry is very much so a community. Totally. And everyone there at the summit was there because they knew Brooke or because they had heard of Brooke or because they knew the founders. And everyone was really there to not only help us in our careers, but to help us become better people. Totally. And everyone there is such an amazing person. And mm -hmm. um, I think that was something that was really cool to me or for me to see that I do want to go into this industry, not just because space is cool and exciting and there's so much to do. And it is. Yeah, it's yes. so much it is. <laughs> Um, but because it's really a community of people and everyone's yeah. really genuinely excited and supportive about the same things, which was just really cool to kind of get an intro into. Yeah. Okay. And they, they answered correctly, right? Yeah. <laughs> it I am taking the great here. <laughs> yeah, but to going off, like, the, like, the Brooke Owens Fellowship has such, such a focus on community, and I feel yeah. like that's really... It's one of the big the big draws to it because yes, the space industry as a whole, you know, everyone knows everybody. But this particular group of thirty six women, like, I'm gonna know them forever. Like, I'll be able to call them, hopefully, fifteen years in the future, and be like, oh yeah, like remember that time when we did this, this, and this. And um, I feel like that's a really valuable part of the program is the community it builds. Mm -hmm. Usually, engineers or leaders like that are mm -hmm. competitive, sure. and I'm competitive, oh, yeah. and I would be like. Uh, why is she doing that? Like, <laughs> why why can't I do that? Sure. But with with them, I feel like I am the cheerleader in the back when yeah. you're doing some like, yeah, go girl, like to do that. Yeah. Um, it it made me feel like I'm close to them, like we're sisters. And uh, that sounds cheesy, but it, it really is true. No, yeah, that's, that's how we feel. Yeah, we have yeah. a Facebook group going where we continue to talk about each other, and we'll once in a while share a link of someone got the astronaut scholarship right. or mm -hmm. just casually had something published or <laughs> right. it's just like okay like just keep them going yeah <laughs> and then, but, yeah it's super super supportive like we'll yeah. all like be like oh yeah you go like that's awesome yeah i feel like there's no competition there's no because i think we all realize that everybody has their own strengths and their own skills and their own yeah. desires mm -hmm. and that's and that's cool and we want everyone to succeed we're not Something that you find, especially yeah, in the air aerospace industry, is that everyone's fighting for the same positions at these top companies. Right. And so there's always a little bit of that, well, if you get it, that that means I might not. Sure. But um, that's, not, that's not the case here. We're all very supportive and just want, want everyone to succeed. So I feel like that's really, that's a really cool part. That's awesome. We're giving extended answers. No, I love it. It's great. Actually, the chat room loves it too. Uh, let me see. hit some buttons. I apologize. Uh, Destructor 1701 says this interview is super uplifting. Huh. Uh, yeah, because you guys are you guys are great. Oh, sweet. Uh, we also have a, <laughs> from off of Twitch. Uh, Loopy Dragon says, "I like that in space. No matter who you work for, you have all you all have the access, or I'm sorry, you all have the same goals and can really be a community even across corporate quote unquote rivalry yeah. lines." Uh, yeah. Uh, Dan TC24 actually has a question. Is the fellowship open to non-engineering folks? Yes. Yeah. The answer is, yeah, there's, um, I remember, yeah, there was like journalism, there was consulting, business aspects. Um, I mean, Will might be able to give a better answer. Yeah, we, uh, certainly engineers are the, are the largest number of, of jobs in sure. there. But uh, we, we both have people who came from science backgrounds rather than engineering yes. who worked in mm -hmm. engineering roles. So we gotcha. had some 
uh, students coming from physics and, and other related departments there. But also we explicitly have jobs for non-engineers working as non-engineers. So that's mm -hmm. doing everything from uh, analysis. We have a couple of great firms like uh, like Bryce, I almost called it Tory Group, it used to be called it Tory Group, uh, Bryce <laughs> and, and, and Avicent uh, in, 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 uh, in the Washington DC area. Um, we had uh, the Museum of Flight up in Seattle. Yeah. Last year we had a journalism spot. This coming year actually we've added some new, fellow, uh, some new hosts to the company. So we have Space Angels in New York City. Awesome. If you're a business and finance major, you want to work for uh, you know, the greatest organization in the world that helps angel investors spend money, uh, put money into, uh, into aerospace startups. Uh, we, we're looking for a job for that. Uh, mm -hmm. The Moat Group, which would be more of a communications job and a little bit of a policy thing. The Airline Pilot Association I already mentioned. Yeah. Uh, we have airports, so people are coming from an operational kind of perspective cool. here. Uh, so, it, so it really is a range, and it is also, even though I think uh, all of us in this room are, are more on the space side of aerospace, yeah. sure. uh, we definitely have air jobs as well. Like I, mm -hmm. I mentioned airports, <laughs> I mentioned Airline Pilots Union, or Association, which is a union. Um, uh, we also have some aircraft manufacturers, Skip Composites <laughs> is a host. We just mm -hmm. announced this week, uh, Airbus is a host as well, and that'll be more on the aviation side. Amazon Prime Air, that'll be on the drone side as well. Um, so, so we try to have a pretty broad range of, uh, a pretty broad range of positions mm -hmm. to appeal to the broad range possible of, of yeah, I love looking women. at the uh, the the companies that are involved and mm -hmm. how all the logos are really tiny because you have to try and fit them on. I mean, it's a web page, it can go on forever, but that doesn't make any sense. So all the logos are like really, really tiny. <laughs> and some of them I was like, who is that? Oh, right, that's who that is, got it. Yeah. We have a nice waiting list. Yeah, yeah. That's so awesome. Uh, Seki in the chat room also asks, is there any aspect of this that reaches down into the high schools? Not well, we, about Seattle, yeah. yeah um, so I was, a, we called ourselves the Seattle group, uh, Bro Brookies. Um, so we were um, just the Brookies at host institutions that were in the Seattle area. Mm -hmm. um, and it was actually after I had ended my um, internship, but some of the fellows that were still there put on um, an event for high school students in the nice. area. Um, and so it was really cool because while we weren't there physically, we were able to kind of help out in putting it together and contacting sponsors and doing all of that. And um, some of our mentors in the area also helped out um, mm -hmm. a great amount as well. Um, but that was really cool to just kind of be able to start giving back. And beyond that, I know so many fellows um, that in their own personal time give back in different ways. And yeah. I think all of us here have done things like that. And yeah, I know I know this, this uh, winter break, because I'm from New Hampshire originally, uh, hi, family, if you're watching. Um, yeah, it must be, because uh, we also have a comment in the, I don't know who the citizen is, but they uh -huh. will know themselves, and I'm sure they will tell us who they are related to. It says, my sister always makes me proud and cry. Uh, <laughs> I <think that's> <laughs> <fine>. <laughs> it's, it's not oh, yeah. my family. It's I love you, Sophie. <laughs> <laughs> Alyssa Casey, if you're watching. Um, but anyway, so I know me personally, I'm planning, uh, when I go back for winter break, um, I had a, a high school teacher, Miss um, Miller, who she taught physics and calculus and is amazing, one of my role models. And I want to go back to her classroom and um, try to give back and be and talk about space and talk about you know how to get involved and try to get people excited and give back in that way. So I don't think there's any official high school reach like reaching out, but I know mm -hmm. that so many of us are like love outreach and giving back. So I think that um, it'll definitely trickle down, totally, so to totally. speak. So speaking of getting involved, for those of us who <clears throat> can't get involved <laughs> in this way, uh, mm -hmm. there are other ways for people to get involved besides being a mentor or besides, uh, well, I guess mentor in a couple of different ways, uh, but you can also mm -hmm. donate. Right? Yes. Uh, there's a donate button on the website. Mm -hmm. We'll never turn down donations, but actually right now the best way I could ask anyone to help is just to spread the word yeah. to every undergraduate woman that you know. Uh, regardless of department, even regardless of nationality, we do have a few positions that are open to non-US persons. So for the parts of your tomorrow audience that are, are watching from abroad, uh, you have admittedly a slightly lower chance, I want to be honest about it, but sure. you, uh, you have a chance to get into the program. Okay. I want I every undergraduate in the world to apply to this program, even though it's going to destroy my December to <laughs> all their applications. Yeah, no uh, kidding. And same for my co-founders. That's a problem, problem yeah. we'll, we'll happily have. And uh, I think I was, we were really happy in our first year at the kind of diversity that we had within the mm -hmm. program mm -hmm. here. You know, we've got, uh, we have uh, applicants coming from the Midwest, the Northeast, and the Middle East. Uh, we have we had students <laughs> from kind of like 
the traditional aerospace uh, universities, but also from HBCUs, from sort of smaller Christian universities, from uh, you know from schools that I didn't even know had an aerospace engineering department. <laughs> and we were able to find leaders and amazing people in, in all these places. But I know that there are even more out there that we didn't get to, mm -hmm. uh, and that sort of burns at me. So uh, any any job that you can do, and, and thanks, Carrie Ann, to you and the Tomorrow Crew for of helping course, us spread yes. the word. But same thing out to your audience. Please share very liberally. Mm -hmm. Applications are due on December 5th. Yes. It does take a little bit of time to put together the application, yes. so I don't want you to discover it on December 4th. Great. Uh, although <laughs> if you do apply anyway, um, but uh, but but uh, please do spread the word. That's the best thing you can do yeah. to help. Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. Uh, there's a well, we're on social media everywhere. Retweet our things. Just the more to get the word out there, the more people can apply and potentially benefit from and, this program. Yeah, and you can ask us questions. Oh yeah, definitely. Like, we will happily answer. We're on Reddit too. That's my job. I'm outreach, so help me spread the word as much as possible. <laughs> We're yeah. also on Reddit, and we have a very healthy uh, Reddit uh, community, awesome. very healthy tomorrow community in general. Oh, that's good. Uh, yeah. Are yeah, really great. So, and just compliment after compliment after compliment on you, lovely ladies. Uh, Thank you. Coming Aww. in from our chat room, which is really amazing. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, we're unable to get you all of the questions and comments mm -hmm. because we could just be here forever, which we all have decided is totally fine. We're just going to keep talking. It's really fun. You yeah. guys can watch or not. That's fine. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think I think we need to kind of close out because we do have some okay. standard questions that yes. I for sure want to get to. Okay. Okay. So there's no right or wrong answers. Okay. So don't worry about that. I may have done a little research on these. Yeah, I, we may have <laughs> sent them to you earlier. Uh, so that, and that's totally fine. Uh, we'll start off with Moon or Mars first. Is that what we think? Yeah. What do or you think? Like, what What's gonna happen or uh, what we like? <laughs> literally says Moon or Mars first. <laughs> I want to go on the Moon first. Yeah. But I feel like the industry is heading to Mars because it's cooler or something. Mm -hmm. um, Colonization on Mars will be a lot easier if we go to the moon. So, um, but I think the industry is heading somewhere else. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. If you asked me like six months ago, I would have said Mars. But I think now there's there's the push with the lunar orbiter, mm -hmm. a collaboration between the U.S. and Russia, and as long along with the um, executive push towards the moon. I think it, I think it will be moon first, if only to prepare for Mars. Nice. Yeah. I'd have to agree. I think moon is a proving ground to Mars. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, would you go? Hell Absolutely. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like, sorry, mom and dad, yeah. but like, going to outer space is yeah. a dream come true. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. In a heartbeat. I appreciate you. Nobody waited. <laughs> <laughs> like, yep. Yeah. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Well, then, answer Moon or Mars? Uh, my guess is if I ever go to the moon or Mars, uh, it'll be in a spaceship that one of these gals is piloting, and I'll just be in the back seat. And wherever they want to go, I'm good. Right? Yeah. Moon pies and RC cola. Humble. Like. <laughs> you don't want me flying anything. Come on. Let's, let's be honest. <laughs> don't worry. I'll be, I'll be the pilot. I got 2020. We'll be good. I love it. I love it. Uh, when do you think humans will land first on Mars? Hmm. I'll give a guess. Like in. 2030. Yeah. Yeah. 2030 is what I, w I would say as well. Um, I'll go ambitious. 2028. Nice. Think with the funding that's coming, and hopefully. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Price is right rules, so yeah. we have that, we, we've got it on camera now, so that's yeah. good. <laughs> when do you think humans will set foot on the moon again? In two decades. Yeah. If, if we're lucky, that's going to happen in 20 years. Oh, see, I, I would say 2022. No, yeah. 2020. 20, yeah. 2022, I think, um, as, yeah, like like in preparation for a longer Mars mission, yeah. I think with a lot of the commercial things, 2020 is looking hopeful, or at least I'm hopeful for 2020. Mm -hmm. Right, totally. And then this is, uh, this one's my favorite. Why space? Because why not? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think just uh, when you're born, human beings are just very curious. The same reason that we climb Mount Everest is the same reason why we want to go to space. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's in our nature, and we would understand our home a lot better and sustain it a lot better if we understand yeah. the other resources somewhere else. Yeah. I mean, wearing the perfect shirt for this. Too. Yes, no, <laughs> definitely. Um, yeah, I can't. I can't really put a finger on why space. I know um, when I was little, I'd watch Star Wars with my with my dad and my family, and um, just have talks about the stars and space. And I think I just realized one day that that's a job that I could have. Mm -hmm. And how you know, I was I liked math and science, and I'm like, why? 
why not work with the coolest job ever? Yeah. And then my passion has just grown and grown the more I've learned about it. Awesome. Yeah, I think it's just kind of the vast unknown, like the capacity for discovery in space is so profound. Yeah. And I always kind of go back to like the pale blue dot and like there's yeah. just so much else mm -hmm. to learn and that's mm -hmm. so exciting for me. Yeah. Uh, cool. Another thing, I also like how it unifies people. Mm -hmm. When countries and companies can work together, um, surpassing you know, pl you know political conflicts and stuff, I feel like space is something that we can all agree is really cool and we, you know, humans as a whole want to explore it and I feel like it's just so unifying. Um, that's another reason why I, I'm very passionate about it. Very cool. In the summit, we met an astronaut, um, oh, Pam, Pam. Pam, and she explained her feelings when she went to space and when she came back to Earth. Mm -hmm. She said there is this feeling that it, it just makes you feel so, so fragile that there is, mm -hmm. you just see Earth and you see home from a completely different perspective. And this is why people love to go to space, to just to see that feeling. And when she came back to Earth, she started smelling grass again. Like oh, right yeah. now, it's, when you're on Earth, it's just like it's a very common scent. Yeah. Um, but when you go somewhere else, it's not like that. You don't smell grass yeah. when you come back. So it's, there's just a lot of personal feelings that people want to go to space as well. Yeah. Very cool. I do yeah. have to say, if you're on the fence about applying to the fellowship, I've met more astronauts in the past six months <laughs> than, I so have, true. than I have in my entire <laughs> life. So if that's... <laughs> If nothing else made you want to apply, <laughs> do, it for, the do it for the astronauts. <laughs> I have an astronaut phone number and I have nice. them on Facebook. Like, that's cool. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> I love oh. it. All right, I'm going to take this one last comment before we go to break okay. uh, off of YouTube from Aloha. Uh, is that Milton? It is. It says, very inspiring stories. Interesting for those thinking of contributing to aerospace industry like myself. So thank you, ladies. You've already made a difference. I appreciate that. Thank, thank you so you. much thank for having us. Yes, thank you. Absolutely. It was a total pleasure. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a little bit of a break. I'm on this camera. Just kidding. And uh, <laughs> when we come back, we're going to take questions and comments about last week's show. Stay with us. There's more tomorrow coming right up. And welcome back to Tomorrow. Now, before we get started with comments from last week's show, a shout out to all of the patrons of Tomorrow who've helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are people who've contributed $10 or more to this specific episode. We also have our orbital patrons. These are people who've contributed $5 or more to this specific episode. And our suborbital patrons. People who've contributed $2.50 or more. To find out how you can help crowdfund the shows of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. Every single penny helps. All right, let's go ahead and get started with comments from last week's show. Now, uh, last week we talked a lot about SpaceX. Due to a conflict of interest, Carrie Ann and I will need to bow out all of a lot of these. So, Jared. <laughs> I feel like talked enough, so I'm, I'm perfectly <laughs> you happy did, That was that. a fantastic interview. That was really great. Uh, that was an easy interview, is what that was. <laughs> uh, every interview with Will Pomerantz, of course, is an easy interview, and anyone that uh, Will Pomerantz is willing to bring on, uh, obviously is, is easy <laughs> enough to talk to. So uh, that had nothing to do with me. I merely asked questions and the lovely ladies of the Miss Brookies, if you will, of uh, the Brooke Owens <laughs> Fellowship uh, answered beautifully. I, I, yeah, you can see why I was so intimidated. Uh, in any case, uh, yes, we did. We spoke with the author of SpaceX from the ground up, uh, one Chris Prophet, talking about the future of SpaceX. There you go, it's a lovely graphic. Wonder who did that. Ooh, <laughs> it's so pretty. It is very, very pretty. Uh, our first comment comes off of Reddit from a one Brandon Mark who likes to just say lots and lots and lots of things. Oh, oh yes. Uh, you know, come back to us for a moment. Uh, <laughs> Holy cats! Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, said, I said our Reddit community no, no, no. is very involved. Uh, yeah, if you want to see an incredible conversation about last week's show, yeah. uh, reddit.com slash r slash tmro 
Oh my goodness. Yeah. It's in depth, it's involved, it's insightful, it's fantastic. There was math done. Oh, it's like. <laughs> it is great. That is a great place I to be. One well, person was like, I'm gonna do this math off the top of my head. I'm like, you're on a computer, you can take your time. <laughs> so like, There's no rush. It's not like no Carrie Ann trying to calculate football uh, lengths on air because that went terribly. All right, anyway, all right. back to the uh, comments. Yeah, so Brandon says, uh, someone brought up sonic booms as an issue with point to point travel using BFRs or big Falcon rockets near, say, New York, uh, New York City, and talked about their experience with Sonic's booms living near Edwards Air Force Base, I think. Uh, would using an oceanic spaceport platform help to alleviate this? Water absorbs noise, but I don't know how Sonic booms would be affected. Mr. Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut, hello, by the way, I haven't had a chance to talk to you yet. Uh, <laughs> you said you might have an answer for us on this one, question mark? Yeah. Well, I actually, I did a video about this. My, I think it's my most recent video on YouTube is about yeah, you're using on the BFR. Now? No, I'm just kidding. I'm, <laughs> I'm just giving you trouble. Uh, wrong show. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> well, anyway, after the self-promotion session, uh, I, I, had, I got into that pretty deep talking about if the BFR can be used as a point-to-point -point transportation. And one of the things that I quoted was that the, the FAA defines significant noise as 65 decibels. So an airport has to stay... Uh, below 65 decibels for an airport, you know, some of us have lived around airports or, you know, maybe stayed in a hotel and we know how loud that is. For reference, the Saturn V at launch, this is not sonic booms, but this, it's actually, or quieter than a sonic boom, at launch was 91 decibels at five kilometers away. No, uh, at, at 10 kilometers away. It was still 91 decibels. So wow. even forget the launch aspect, the, the sonic booms, that's at 10. If we go, if we take that out to, let's see, if we go... 38 kilometers out, that drops to 79 decibels. So that's 24 miles away for us uh, Americans. And then if we go out to uh, 160 kilometers or 100 miles away, that still is only at 67 decibels. So it, I mean, yeah, that's something that's going to have to be taken into account. You know, I don't know if that's feasible to land uh, constantly having sonic booms happen. You know, if this was three times a day and you're going to have something landing near New York City. It's got to be far away before everyone in that city hears and feels that three times a day. Well, I, uh, yeah, I guess maybe that's why in the uh, in the video they showed the SpaceX Navy on that boat getting all the way out to wherever it is you have to go to in order to make that uh, quiet, I guess. Yeah, and it will have to be even further away than that problem. I mean, it's going to have to be a long ways away, which is why I think something like a Hyperloop to get there is a lot a little more feasible than a boat that might take two hours to get you like 100 kilometers away or something, but it will have to be a long ways away for the sonic booms to not be really, really, really bad. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, let me toss that to Jared really quick. Uh, maybe you can answer this. Um, you know, things absorb waves, right? Yes, they so, do. So a sonic boom is a, a compression artifact of the air. Yes. Um, and, you know, water does absorb sound. Yes, it does. Uh, but um, this is a compression artifact. So would, would water be able to absorb this highly compressed kaboom. So if you were under the water, sure, <laughs> it'll absorb it for you. Um, but the thing about a sonic boom is it's going out in all directions in the direction of travel that sure. your vehicle is going. Yep. Um, so that means if you're coming in towards New York City, uh, you're still going to have compre uh, a, compressional, a compression wave roll through New York City. It may not be as strong because of the distance away, um, but it's still going to roll. There's still going to be from a certain angle that will have the compression wave aimed directly at where whatever you're. But what coming if it's a there. high angle of attack so, coming? Um, well, high what, angle of attack. It will still go out, and it sure. will still it will it's still worse, generate. Actually. Yeah, it'll be even worse. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah, not not the best way Let's to go about it. So curtain of curtain of water that can. Spread the across, across the entire coast. <gasps> you know who has them. that? <laughs> uh, Disneyland, California Adventure. <laughs> That's right. He needs to go taller than that, though. Disney Just a little taller. No. <laughs> we'll, really have, taller. we'll have the we'll have the BFR land right in the middle of World of Color as it's coming down. <laughs> <And> that ought, <laughs> to, that ought to stop it. Yeah, well, no, it's, <laughs> it's going to be a matter then of getting it far enough off the coast where that sonic boom doesn't traverse into mm -hmm. the coast enough to create a difference, and then yeah. figuring out that angle of attack to come back in. I still so feel like that's going to be really, really difficult. Uh, to do because even when space shuttle came in here in Los Angeles, it wasn't like 
it wasn't like a two or three mile strip of land that ended up hearing the sonic boom. Like the entire LA area heard a sonic boom on entry. If you were anywhere on the re-entry path, um, even out at Edwards where it landed at, there was still a sonic boom out there even though um, it eventually reached subsonic speeds. So um, it's, it's going to be a problem, um, but I'm pretty sure people uh, will Jazz Throw will it has a perfect, it, so. perfect uh, a remedy. You just launch in the eye of a hurricane. Oh, I mean, really? really, it's landing through the eye, right? That's what sure, we need to do. Sure. We're doing like a reverse <laughs> marooned movie yeah. and launching right in the middle there of the Another the great B so. movie. Okay, yeah. moving on. Uh, next comment comes off of YouTube. Uh, Jerome Snail? Jerome? Or Jerome Snail. Yeah. yeah. Jerome? I don't know. Yeah, well. <laughs> yeah. They get the point. Uh, I think Chris had a good point. At the end of the interview, humans tend to do their best when they face a seemingly impossible challenge. Of course, I'm excited by the idea of mankind reaching new worlds, but I'm even more excited by all the new technologies it will bring us. Jared? Yeah, that's that's really kind of the the, the one of the big drivers of doing space um, is the, the, the technological development. You Would get you from say it. spin-off and, technologies possibly? Yes, but I'm not going to go into that because that's a semi sort of lame way of. Uh, of, of you just uh, said it was what, like a big push. For it's a it. big it's a big push, but it's not necessarily right. my okay, favorite good. part I just, of I the big push. It doesn't have to be your favorite. It. So Clar I'm clarify. Saying, so for so. those who don't know, I have a gripe with spin-off technologies <laughs> when they're used to. to Justify a program. The program that, needs to stand on its own two feet. I yes. don't have a. That's where. The, that's why I'm rolling my eyes. I don't have an issue with spin-off technology. Spin-off technologies are great and fine, but they can't be the primary justification of a program. If you're like, well, we need to do this, so we get the spin-off tech. Then I'll just go build the, build the spin-off tech. Anyhow. Yeah, it's like end you, of can't, rant. you can't look at like a Tempur-Pedic <laughs> mattress and say, yeah, shuttle was worth it for that. You know. Have you slept on one? Because I think maybe it was actually <laughs> worth sure. it. Sure. Um, but, <laughs> but but I like to say, go ahead, go ahead, Tim. Um, I like to say one of the things is how do you solve world hunger? How do you solve, you know, if you take these really big things head on, you can't really solve it. But sometimes when you tackle a weird side issue, like how instead of solving world hunger, how do you feed people on Mars, which is a, a planet that is hostile and, and a terrible place to try to grow and grow food? If you can solve how to, you know, live on Mars and, and eat off the Martian soil, perhaps that does tickle down into trickle or tickle down into like <laughs> you know, something that can be used here on earth yes no absolutely, you know? absolutely. and that's that's kind of the way i see it as you don't tackle problems like that head on you 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 start working on weird odds and ends and, and the space industry has some of the brightest minds in the world so yeah Water reclamation is another one, right? You use it, the mm -hmm. International Space mm -hmm. Station recycling yep. 99 point and then however many decimals deep of their water. Uh, that's going to become a bigger and bigger deal here on Earth. And in many areas of the Earth, it already is a really big deal. So uh, being able to utilize that technology, although we need to find ways to make it less expensive. Mm -hmm. But yes, absolutely. All right. Um, next up, <laughs> next, Capcom. Next one uh, also comes off of YouTube. Uh, SP123100. Or 123-100? Yeah, I, I, yeah, anyway. Uh, do you think SpaceX would ever delay a launch due to sea conditions being too rough at the drone ship recovery point to attempt a landing? Is the cost of delaying a launch worth more to them than the cost of a recovered stage one? Mr. Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, I bet you, did you have a video on this at all? <laughs> <laughs> well, I do a live stream here tomorrow. <laughs> uh, thanks, guys, yeah. Uh, <laughs> this is like a funny topic. Uh, you know, at this point, the, we, it's always been an experimental thing, you know, to, to land on the, the drone ship and all this stuff. And now it's to the point where there are 15 consecutive landings and we're recovering $30 million worth of hardware at some point. I, I don't know. Maybe there is an answer to this, a straight up answer. But my speculation would be at some point, honestly, yes, SpaceX is going to have to be like, wait, guys, uh, we're, we can't land. So we're gonna have to screw up the mission. It's a lot cheaper to refuel the $200,000 and all the range safety and reset all that for maybe, what, $2 million? I have no idea. But it's still, you know, a lot cheaper than losing a $30 million piece of hardware, so. Yeah, and if I remember correctly, speculation. early in the development of Falcon 9 landing, uh, there were several missions where they couldn't get the drone ship out and they just went ahead and did soft landings in the ocean. If I recall correctly, I, someone on the internet will correct me if I'm wrong. I'm sure um, they will. What? The internet sure. correct you? No. So, um, but, um, it's okay, nobody's watching I'm show. also <laughs> wondering, especially with point to point, because we're going to be doing point to point with, with 
rockets here, um, which is the, pl the plan. Um, I'm wondering if, if weather at your landing and your launch site is going to affect you as well, um, because a rocket engine is essentially generating an ionized plume, um, and if you send an ionized plume <laughs> into clouds at the right time, you get this wonderful thing um, that's called electrical discharge, um, which is also known as lightning. Um, so, and that's lightning and rockets mix very well no, together. They right do here. not. No, 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 they don't. No, they no. don't. No. Uh, try the electrification paint. Try, try SCE to ox. Yeah, SCE to ox. <laughs> um, that'll recycle the computer. Um, and uh, I, I kind of wonder if that's going to end up inhibiting it because people always make the great joke, the grand joke. Oh, well, space technology is so good. How come rockets get delayed because of clouds? And it's like it's a, actually it's a very important thing that you don't like you know uh, hit your rocket with lightning that's why we don't launch yeah. into certain types of clouds but to be fair um, we have in fact hit rockets with lightning we have a SCE to ox yes it's Apollo fine. 12 a great example of hitting a rocket with lightning twice um, and um, and everything worked um, but I, I you know I'm not really big on hitting rockets with lightning all that often isn't so. that uh, so uh, couldn't that be just an engineering challenge? I mean, they have tribal electrification paint. They have a way yeah. to I mean, de-electrify these things. Now, obviously, it's not ideal, but you hit, you hit. Um, what are, what are those things that fly through the sky? Airplanes. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. But I, I feel like the the, t the tolerances in spaceflight are are an order of magnitude much more difficult than the tolerances for, for an airplane. Sure, for um, now. But I mean, for now, yeah, obviously. I mean, um, uh, you know, this is, I guess this is one of those things where I'm definitely A-OK -okay with being wrong about it at some point. So, yeah. So, All right. <laughs> well, I guess we'll find out in the future. So, uh, Actually, Mika has a really good question from the chat room, which is, how would the carbon fiber of the Big Falcon rocket react to a lightning strike? That's a great question. Yeah, I don't know that we've had to, I don't know that, Anyone Anyone's has encountered that? Well, Boeing 787s, the wings are yeah. carbon fiber. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it's it's mostly carbon fiber. So, yeah. and, and I, Boeing's, car you know, probably had to take into account that. And carbon fiber is electrically conductive. Mm -hmm. mm. Unless right. you properly isolate it. All right. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thank moving you. on. Moving on. Moving on. Thank yeah. you, Peanut Gallery. <laughs> uh, next comment comes off of Facebook. <clears throat> Bradicus. Colmanius? Br Bradicus uh, Colmanius. Yeah, yeah, that's a pretty good name. I like <laughs> that one. Right? There you go. Yeah. That's what I'm going with. Uh, wouldn't SpaceX be able to build a space station that is twice or three times the size of the International Space Station? And couldn't a fleet of Big Falcon spaceships be permanently <laughs> kept in orbit? Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut. Yeah. Jared yeah. Head. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, because <laughs> Great, BFS, I was going to say, BFS, it's like, what, 800-some-odd cubic meters of interior volume, and the space station, the International Space Station is something like just about 900-some-odd cubic meters of interior volume, so that would mean that uh, two BFSs and you got about uh, just under twice the interior volume of uh, the International Space Station. So two BFSs is one ISS? Uh, two BFSs is like 1.8 ISS. So right. that should be, that's a fun one. Good luck, three, captions. Three BFS. So. Greater than one oh, ISS. Man. Okay, this is a, this is we, a BFS mess. Can we get the shirt of the show? So. <laughs> no, we already had a shirt of the show that was earlier. I just forgot what it is. <laughs> yeah, actually, imagine that though, right? You get a common, uh, common uh, docking mechanism, kind of like what the station was built around, and mm -hmm. you get like, like five or six BFSs in a in a circle. That's going to be yeah, that'd be cool. That'd be pretty so, awesome. Oh, can, yeah. can it look like a oldie timey drive-in? Not a drive-in, uh, like a drive-up, uh, uh, like soda shop, like hamburger soda shop. So like all these like BFSs are just like yeah. parked at the. I mean, I guess. You get, yes. you get sure. space girls on skates just rolling out, <laughs> taking the order, <laughs> going back in. In EVA suits? You mean like a Sonic? Yeah, like a Sonic. Yeah. Like a, that's an oldie, tiny, what? <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. I'm super into this. I want all this. Yeah, see? It's all, yes, it's exactly. It's to everything. It can happen. It's just money. All it's right. just money. It's just, well, we just print more. Just push the uh, button. Next comment comes off of YouTube. Last comment. From Attic Land. Mm -hmm. So the big Falcon question is, <laughs> did this talk make you more or less optimistic about the big Falcon rocket plan and timeline? Uh, Jared. Um, well, I'm, I, <laughs> having been involved in aerospace for a little bit, um, uh, optimism about schedules is something that is <laughs> absolutely rife. Um, but of course, as you know, um, everything moves to the right. Uh, because that's just the way it is. Uh, 
uh, you could say aerospace is, is right-handed, um, if you will, because it always moves to the right. Oh, um, wow. So we'll see. I don't. <laughs> don't I feel like I, I feel like I should do this. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I feel like it's it's not gonna meet the t it's not gonna meet the timeline because there's there's gonna be big challenges that come out of it. Um, that that actually some of those big challenges challenges in doing something that are, no one's ever done before. Those, what? Those some of those challenges are already being met, like using uh, uh, carbon composites for your your cryo. Oh. Like holy smokes, that was something that killed uh, the uh, the X thirty three Venture Star uh, back in the nineties. So um, which by the way, if you want to see some epic YouTube video, YouTube that X thirty three Venture Star, uh, Venture Star and yeah. like they're just incredible. Incredible videos. Yeah, yeah, that linear air spike is sick. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very spike is sick. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's it's definitely going to move. It, it didn't change how I felt about it because I kind of have a, a good understanding of well, a, a moderately okay understanding of how things tend to work in aerospace and and it's always you know it's going which way is right is right this way it's always going that way. It yeah. is to them. Yes, this so, is our right. That's their go. right. Yeah. Okay. So. Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut. Uh, the, everything on last week's show just solidified how I feel, which is that I think it's all going to happen. Just, I mean, it, it's just like Jared said. I mean, I don't think anyone expects it to go exactly in that fashion, but I think we're going to be darn close. Uh, I think Space Mike brought up the best point about two or three weeks ago or whenever that was during the roundtable when he said, don't forget, five years ago is the first time SpaceX launched something to the International Space Station. And it was only like their second launch of the... Falcon 9 ever, and now all of a sudden we're landing rockets like it's nothing. Imagine what's going to be in five more years, you know? Mm. So yeah. uh, that's something I, I keep in my head, you know? Five years from now is 2022. If the BFR isn't going to heading to Mars in 2022, I think we, we're going to see some hardware ro running around and, 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 and starting to fly around that time, though, anyway. Maybe it's not quite Mars ready, but, I, I, you know, yeah. It's exciting. It's exciting stuff, right? I mean, we're seeing lots of yeah. things happen in aerospace. By the way, not just with SpaceX, with Blue Origin, with uh, the Virgin mm -hmm. entities, with um, yep. uh, Strato Launch, with you, Maston. You got all these different companies. You're really pushing the industry forward, and it, it's it's quite exciting to watch. Uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. before before we go into uh, the end of the show, um, you know, uh, first off, Tim Dot, the Everyday Astronaut. Thank you so much for taking time out of your Saturday and filling in for uh, uh, the hologram of Space Mike as he is repaired. <laughs> um, uh, but you do have your own channel, and while we were mocking you for bringing it up, it's, <laughs> just because it was funny, where can people go to find your channel? Because you, you do love SpaceX, and you, you go into way more depth on SpaceX on your channel, so where can people find that information? Yeah, uh, on YouTube, Everyday Astronaut, you can find it there, Read it, YouTube slash Everyday Astronaut or whatever, yeah. All right, great. Thank you so yeah. much, Tim Dodd, the Everyday <laughs> Astronaut. Uh, He's although, like, I'm everywhere. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, 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 the chat room, and it was way, way earlier, so I'm not sure I can find it, was upset that you were not in your spacesuit. I'm just going to throw that out there. Uh, and so next time I expect not <laughs> just the spacesuit, but the helmet as well, because I know how comfortable that is. No, All I right. think I vote for the T-shirt. <laughs> oh, yeah, the T-shirt, the T-shirt. All right. Um, yeah, I'm get back into that. That's our show for this week. I also wanted to thank our ground support patrons for helping to make this happen. These are people who contributed between one and $2.49. Once again, we're a crowdfunded show. Every single dollar helps. You guys keep us on the air week after week, month after month, year after year, until suddenly we've done this for 10 orbits. Uh, to find out how you can help crowdfund the shows of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. Uh, next week's show, so we're hitting the holiday season. Next week's mm -hmm. show is kind of uh, questionable at this point. Uh, we are definitely not on for the uh, show during the, the Saturday after Thanksgiving. This, yeah, we're the, both 25th. In the, the 25th. Yeah, the 25th. Yeah, there you go. So Saturday 25th, there is no show. Then we enter December, and so it's going to be spotty from here until the end of the year. Uh, but we've got, we'll have some other stuff for our patrons, including uh, hangouts and whatnot happening there. Mm -hmm. uh, that's our show. I'd like to thank you all so much for watching. After Dark, up next. <laughs>